John chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him a dinner there for him. Martha served and Lazarus, the one who was re- reconciled, who had been, uh, excuse me, Martha served and Lazarus, one who was reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charged and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself with what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you will not always have me. Verse 9, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on the account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. May the Lord add his public or his blessing to the public reading of the scriptures this morning. The human heart is an amazing organ. Each day it pumps nearly 100,000 times, pushing an equivalence of 2,000 gallons of blood through 60,000 miles of arteries and veins and capillaries through your body. It is mission critical that your heart is well. It's operational critical. And if you don't keep it well, then the operation you will have will be critical. The Bible speaks a lot about our heart, but when it speaks about our heart, it's not speaking of that physical muscle pumping inside of our chest right now. It speaks metaphorically about the place where we actually arise out of. The Bible talks about our heart as being the core of our being, the center of who we are. It's the place where you decide and desire and you deliberate. It's the most important of all places. As a matter of fact, the Scripture teaches us that we are to keep our heart or we are to guard our heart with all diligence because out of it flows all the issues of our life. Our heart was deeply wounded, deeper than we probably imagine in the events of the garden when Adam and Eve, our first parents, disobeyed God and sin entered into the heart of man. Not just separating us, but bringing evil and wickedness into the core of our own nature and being. Jeremiah sums it up in one sentence. He says, the human heart is the most deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can really know how bad it is? (laughs) Well, God can. And God has a remedy for a sick heart and a dark heart. And it is the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we turn to our text this morning, we are gathering at a mill with Jesus and his disciples, a mill that will reveal the hearts of those who have gathered. There's something about gathering in the name of Christ and the presence of Christ that is revealing to us, not just about who's in the room and what others are doing, but it reveals who we are. And it is my prayer today as we work through our text and through this moment together that God would, by his Holy Spirit, turn on the great floodlight of his truth into our hearts that it might reveal who we are because this is a mill that reveals the heart well let me give you a little context about what's going on and not just read the text but give you the picture john chapter 12 is an amazing turn in john's gospel John 1 through 11 is referred to as the book of signs, where John uses seven signs as he refers to them. We refer to them as miracles. 
that point us towards Jesus Christ as being God's Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in Him we would have everlasting life. John chapter 1 through John chapter 11 really encapsulates Jesus' three and a half years of ministry. That's the time frame in which it covers. When we get to John chapter 12, there is a stark turn and the brakes are put on solidly. From John chapter 12 through the end of John's gospel, these chapters focus in on one week of Jesus' life. Matter of fact, within these chapters, the high focus comes down to 48 hours of Jesus' life, the final week of his life. Jesus is now back in the city of Bethany. And as we discovered last week, Bethany was his landing place when he would come into the city of Jerusalem during the different feasts and festivals to worship the Lord. Bethany is a small town on the eastern side of Jerusalem, just over the Mount of Olives. And there he had some dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, whom he has raised from the dead. We remember that because we studied that last week in John chapter 11. After that event, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the polarization of Jesus had reached a critical moment. People either loved him or they wanted to kill him. Jesus leaves Bethany and he goes to the other side of the Jordan and there he stays till this moment when he's coming back in in the spring of the year where he will celebrate Passover for the very last time where he himself will be the fulfillment of Passover being the lamb sent from God to be sacrificed for the sins of man. Well, Jesus comes once again to the city of Bethany And there they throw a dinner party for him. And this story is also recorded in Matthew and Luke's gospel. So even though all the details are not given to us in John's, I'm going to tie in some of those moments to help us get a greater picture and the different textures. We discover that this meal that's being hosted, not by Mary and Martha or Lazarus, but at another man. Matthew tells us it's Simon the leper who has invited Jesus as his guest of honor with the disciples and their friends Peter or Lazarus, Mary, and Martha to come to a meal in celebration of Christ and they, there they will celebrate. It's quite a guest of honors list. I mean, obviously, you got Jesus, the Son of God. You got the 12 disciples. You got Mary and Martha. You got Lazarus. But you also have this new guy that we're not very familiar with. He's called Simon the leper which probably is a bad name for him because we know this. A leper could not have gathered for dinner with them. It's probably Simon the ex-leper. Can you imagine that guy being at this dinner table with Lazarus? Can you imagine how wonderful that conversation must have been that night as they gather around the table and say, hey, let's go around and tell our stories. Simon, some of the guys don't know you very well. Tell us your story. And he says, well, you know, life is going really well. Business was good. Marriage was good. Had a couple kids, growing them up. You know, we're doing rec league. And then one day I I noticed this scar that wouldn't heal. And then it got worse. And then our greatest fears were uh, realized. I was diagnosed with leprosy. We did everything we could, but there's no cure for it. Before I knew it, I was sick and weak. My skin was beginning to swell. I was losing feeling in my hands and feet. I was set outside of the city and I had to join a leper colony. I lost my business, my family. I couldn't worship our God. My life was going downhill as fast as you can imagine. I hit it rock bottom. But then one day, one day, this rabbi from Galilee named Jesus, he came into my life and he touched me and I was healed. And God has restored everything to my life. Can you imagine hearing that story? And the guy's going, that's amazing. Lazarus, tell us your story. And Lazarus says, who and I? Uh, Okay. Everything was going well in my life too. And then one day I caught a cold. I thought it was allergies. The next thing I know, I am spiraling downhill. The last thing I remember on this side was Mary and Martha, my sister, saying to the servants, go get Jesus. This is desperate. The next thing I know, I die and I end up in paradise in the bosom of Abraham. 
And I see Moses and David, and I'm enjoying their fellowship. And four days later, as I'm just sort of hanging out with them, I hear a voice like no other voice I've ever heard before calling my name. And the next thing I know, I'm back in the grave, and I'm being picked up, and I hear him say, loose him and let him go. And as they unwrap my bandages, the first person I see is Jesus. How would you like to have been Bob, the one who has to tell the next story? <laughs> All right, Bob, watch yours. Well, I, um, I heard him speak on a Sunday somewhere. I, I... Can you imagine what that room would have been like? But it's in that room we find five hearts that are revealed. Five hearts. Some have been transformed and some are so polluted. And I pray now that the Holy Spirit of God would help us to see the work that he wants to do in our hearts so that we can recline at the table with Jesus and tell our story with great boldness and glory and satisfaction of what Christ has done in our life. So let's take a look at these characters for a moment, if you will. The first one, of course. We discover the heartfelt service of Martha. The heartfelt service of Martha. Verse number two. So they gave a dinner for Jesus there. And notice this little phrase. Martha served. You may want to underline that because this is a powerful little phrase that we will miss if we don't take a moment to examine it. It says Martha served. We would miss it because we're not really surprised by this statement that Martha was serving. We've come to know Martha as one who is always serving. However, I want to submit to you that this Martha that we experience at this meal with Christ is different than the Martha we experienced in Luke chapter 10. You remember that story when they were giving Jesus a meal at Mary and Martha's home. And Martha is all busy about the preparations of the meal. She's working hard to cook for God. She's trying to get all the, the, the menu items to come together at the right time. She had to set the tables, do the dishes, do all the planning until she comes to a point where she is so frustrated, she walks out to the Lord and she says, Master, do you not see what's going on here? I am left to do all this serving all by myself. And here my sister sits at your feet like she just has this wonderful position and no one here is helping me and I feel a little victimized and unappreciated and this is wrong. And since you're Jesus, you ought to do something about that. You remember that story? And do you remember what Jesus said to her? Well, if your name is Martha, you know exactly what he said to her because you've heard this phrase over your life several times. Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> Martha, you're so caught up in all of this, you can't even enjoy what you're doing. And Mary's chosen a better thing to sit at my feet. And here's what I want to submit to you that we may have done unintentionally. We may have somehow dismissed or at least diminished the beauty of Martha's calling to serve. That somehow what she's doing is less than. I don't believe it was that at all. But rather I believe she just needed to allow the Lord over time and process to help her to find that God had given her a remarkable gift to serve. That was unique and beautiful and necessary and meaningful. Because now, in John chapter 12, we don't get all that. It's as though we see a different transformed Martha who is there serving. Notice this. She's not even serving at her home. Why? Because we remember that this story happens at Simon the leper's. She is a guest, and she willingly gets up, and she walks into the kitchen and says, What can I do to help? You all know someone like that in your world, don't you? You know that person who just has this heart to serve, this heart to be a part of it. You have them over to your house, and you plan on them serving, or you serving them and them enjoying the evening, but they always make their way somehow into the kitchen, and they say, what can I do to help? Or they're the first ones to say, hey, let me help you load the dishwasher, or hey, let me help you with that engine, or help, let me help you here. There's someone out there, and I think there is something that is so dynamic and beautiful right here. 
that maybe some of us need this morning to go back to a place where God has given us this gift by which we can serve through the gift of hospitality and other means. And instead of feeling as though our role is diminished or not necessary, we recognize the words of Jesus that the greatest in the kingdom are those that serve. And what we see in Martha is this heartfelt service that has been transformed as she has walked and she has moved with and she has grown in Jesus Christ. The Bible honors service. And Christ holds it as a high, high value in the kingdom of God. How beautiful it is to see men and women who have a heart to serve the Lord without need of recognition, without need of celebration, but just out of a heart that this is my moment. This is my calling. I serve. The second person we see here is this humble sacrifice of Mary. Uh, This is the person who really kind of captures our attention in the story because of her remarkable expression of love and worship to Jesus, verses 3 and 4. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance, the fragrance of the perfume. Here we see the lavish and sanctified and deep, overwhelming flow of love that Mary has for the Lord. Notice the great detail that John gives us as the Holy Spirit inspires John to write down the details of her extravagant, overflowing love and worship to the Master. First of all, notice the cost. It's identified in the story that this oil, this spikenard, that it was worth 300 denarii, which would have been a day laborer's yearly wage. Uh, If you were to extrapolate that in our uh, modern economy and and, and factor it all in, you're talking about a, a little... A vase of oil that was worth fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars, and it was full of this spikenard. It says pure nard, and what exactly is that? It, it was a perfume, a, an oil perfume that was imported from Israel that grew in northern India, around China and Nepal, in that area. And there's these old spikes of a root that would come up and they would dig it up and they would begin to squeeze it out. And out of that would come a resin, an oily resin that was highly, highly fragrant. And it was often in the color red. Now, this was high value. This was high cost. We don't even know how Mary would have ended up with this. Because this is not something that you would have found in every Jewish villager's home. A little thing of oil, of fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars in our dollars. How did she even get it? Well, we don't know. There's speculation. It's very possible that it was an heirloom from the family that had been passed down. There's also speculation it was a part of her dowry that her father had given her that she would have used on her wedding day. Because it was such precious oil and so beautiful in fragrance that a bride would take it and in her preparations for a wedding, she would pour it on herself. What it was was precious. What it was, it was deeply attached emotionally to her and her life. It was costly. But not only was it the cost, it was the container. It's an alabaster box, which we can imagine, if you will, like a marble box. And it was sealed from the inside. And once you broke the seal, then it was open. But it wasn't just that, it's the fragrance. Notice what John tells us. He says, when she takes this precious oil and she begins to anoint Jesus. And Matthew and Luke says that she begins at his head and she anoints him on the head and it begins to run down his garments and ultimately comes to his feet where she anoints as well. It says that the fragrance of that oil filled the room. It it wasn't that just those who were near Jesus could smell this, but now the whole room permeated with this beautiful, beautiful smell. And, And it and it, and it made its way into the kitchen, and everybody's going, what is, what is that beautiful, is that Spikenard? 
And they walk into the living room and they see this expression of this lavish, lavish love that Mary has for the master. Now, the way it happens is this. It says, you'll remember verse 1, that they were reclining at the table in the Middle East, especially a couple thousand years ago, but even today. uh, When they gather for these large meals, it's not like we do, and we set up some plastic tables with chairs around them, and we get all our food at once, and then in about 15 or 20 minutes, we're done, and we get up and we move on. But these type of meals would last a couple of hours. And they were not in hard chairs, but they were in, on pillows and couches. And they would recline and they would actually lay on one side and their feet would actually be behind them. And they would take their hands and they would eat out of common bowls and they would laugh and there'd be different courses throughout the night. And the meal would last a couple of hours. And while Jesus is laughing with the other ones, Mary comes up from behind and she takes this alabaster box and she breaks it and she begins to anoint his head. What was the purpose of this? It was an expression of her love, of Christ's worship, but we also discover that Jesus says she was anointing his body for death. That she recognized that Jesus was more than just a miracle worker. She was noticing that he was more than just giving her principles for successful living. But this was going to be the one who would be the sacrifice, who would offer up his life for her. And when she considered that, there came this overwhelming love and appreciation and worship. And so she was saying, there's nothing too valuable that I would withhold from you, Lord. There's nothing that I will keep to myself. You are more precious than anything. You're more worthy than anything I know. And I give you my very best. I empty out my dowry. I empty out my life in worship and honor and this overwhelming, unrelenting love that she has for the Master. It was magnificent. It was beautiful. It was awkward. Because at one point, she takes her hairpin out and she lowers her hair, which would have been scandalous in that culture, and she begins to wipe his feet. She knows what's about to happen. We say, well, how is it possible that she even knew this? When you find Mary in the Scripture, she is always at one position. She is always at the feet of Jesus. You never find Mary other places than at the feet of Jesus. When in Luke chapter 10, they were having Jesus over for dinner, she was at the feet of Jesus learning. In John chapter 11, even when Lazarus had dead, when Jesus came back to town, the scripture says that Mary went out and fell at his feet. And here, once again, we see her sitting at the feet of Jesus. I've learned, and I bet many of you have learned, when you sit at the feet of Jesus, he gives you insight. He gives you direction. He gives you revelation. The Bible says in Proverbs that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, the glory of a king to pursue that matter out and to search it out. And I believe what we see in Mary is this woman who longed to be at the feet of Jesus, to be taught by Jesus, to be instructed by Jesus, to receive the wisdom of Jesus. And as she did, God gave a revelation. You know why? Because we know this much. As Jesus is coming back, coming through Jericho, he tells his disciples, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. They're going to try me. They're going to crucify me. And on the third day, I'll rise again. And guess what? None of them caught it. But Mary did. There's something about being at the feet of Jesus that changes everything. There's something about sitting as some of you remember the great Jesus movement in the 70s and 80s. There was a little song that came out of it from Mary's experience and says, If you want to know the power of God, get down at Jesus' feet. If you want to know the love of God, get down at Jesus' feet. If you want to know the truth of God, get down at Jesus' feet. Get down, sinner, get down, sin, get down at the feet of Jesus. Mary's heart is bursting forth with extravagant sacrificial worship. Silence fills the room. Imagine this. The testimony of Simon. The testimony of Lazarus. The service out of a heartfelt life of Martha. And now this extravagant worship of Mary is just penetrating everything. And there is a holy hush and silence that falls over the place. But that... Silence would not last. A horrible interruption to this beautiful expression of extravagant love comes. 
And it's the hypocritical, self-absorbed Judas who decides to speak. From a heart of worship, we now see a heart that is owned by greed and ambition and self-interest. As far as Judas was concerned, everything that could go wrong had gone wrong. Judas had chosen to follow Christ and was chosen by Christ to follow. But he followed so that he might eventually be elevated to power and authority. That they would see the overthrow of the Roman government and Judas would have his day in the sun. But when Jesus started talking about loving your enemies... And praying for those who persecute you. And laying down your life as a sacrifice for others. It was more than Judas could stand. And Judas would come to a place in his own life that he would not only reject Christ, he would hate Jesus. And in this man we see a heart of hypocrisy. Notice verse number 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples... He who was about to betray him said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now on the surface, this sounds really good. Every board member of every church would say amen to this. I mean, we got to be good stewards. We got to take care of the Lord's possessions. We got to see about the poor. What about the poor? We don't need this type of extravagance worship. Why are we wasting this here? There are poor that we ought all of it. And it looked good. It sounded good. But notice verse number 6. John points it out to us. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Well, John didn't mince any words. John didn't say he's having a bad day. God's still working on him. John said, this brother's a thief. He didn't care a thing in the world about the poor. He said, and having change a uh, charge of the money banks, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So when they were to receive an offering at the crusades, it was Judas who would say, hey, uh, yeah, I'm just going to make a little change in the offering plate here. And, just... and what we discover here is that Judas' first words that are ever recorded in the Scripture are these words of hypocrisy his last words that were recorded are this I have betrayed innocent blood for 300 denarii he would rob Jesus of Mary's love if he had his way later he would sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver which would have been about 4 months wage Judas lived the most tragic of all lives he was an embezzling thief. The great tragedy is that he had such an opportunity. He had such access. He walked with Christ. He talked with Christ. He saw the kingdom of God come through Christ. And yet he never set aside his own self-ambition to surrender to the Lord. When he makes this statement, Judas is... Shouldn't this be done? Jesus responds in no uncertain terms. Leave her alone. I have found there is a holy protection for those that will worship at the feet of Jesus. I have found there is a place of solace and refuge for those who will find themselves at the feet of Jesus. And even when others that appear religious and others that appear to be pious, others that appear to have the right attitude, I'm telling you there is a holy divine reverence that God gives to his people that find themselves lavishing their love on him and giving praise to him. I've learned in my own journey, Tony, if you'll stay at the feet of Jesus, Jesus will rebuke those that are trying to come against you and against what God is doing in your life in this moment and Jesus turned to him and said leave her alone and he says these words the poor you always have with you why would Jesus say that is Jesus somehow diminishing our care for the poor not at all Jesus is actually doing what Jesus often did he quotes one of his favorite books in the Bible Deuteronomy in Deuteronomy, it said, the poor will always be with you and be sensitive, be aware, and always make provision to help those who have needs. He says, the poor you'll always have with you and you should be sensitive, but you won't always have me with you. 
In other words, there comes moments by which we must be in, in tune with the needs, but we must be insistent on the presence of Christ in the moment. There are moments in our life that are cataclysmic moments that set forth everything in the presence of God. And it's not that the poor don't matter. It just means in this moment, embracing him and what he's doing right here, right now, is the most important. It's not diminishing the poor. It's recognizing and elevating the moments that God breaks into our life in such a way that we embrace those fully. Judas, in the presence of Christ, now stands rebuked, crushed, devastating in this decisive moment. He bolts out of the door and he runs to meet leaders and he says to them, I want to make a deal and I'll tell you when and where you can get him. And he negotiates now to betray Christ for 30 pieces of silver. It was a heart that was at the mill that was corrupt with hypocrisy. Let me give you two more and we'll come to the table ourselves. The next group is the hollow celebration of the crowd. The hollow celebration of the crowd. Verse number 9. When the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on his account, but also to see Lazarus from whom he raised from the dead. So the crowds come now to Bethany. They had this hollow superficiality of their own life. The people were there and they were curious about Jesus and they were curious about Lazarus. They were curious about the miracles that Jesus would do, but they were not interested in surrendering their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They had their own agenda. They wanted Jesus to be the one that would deliver them from the oppressive hands of the Romans. They wanted a political king that would rule them politically, but they did not want a heart king that would rule their hearts and lives for eternity. Therefore, they framed Jesus in the way they wanted Jesus to be. And how much of the crowd that comes to the house of the Lord today is not about surrendering to the Lordship of Christ, but rather we want to form Jesus in our likeness and in our own image so that he will be the God that we have somehow formed in our wants and our needs and our demands. And when we get that idea that we can do that, we do what they did the next day when they said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But within six days, that same hollow celebration of Christ, now Christ to the, turns to the cries of crucify, crucify, crucify. We don't want a Savior. We want a God formed and fashioned in our image. Here's the last one, and I'll close. It was the hostile leaders. Then the account closes in verses 10 and 11, and the hostile leaders are scheming leaders. Verse number 10 says, So the chief priest, did you hear that? So the chief priest, the highest religious leaders of the day, those who would have been the ones who have submitted to and surrendered to and obliged themselves to the word of the Lord, the commands of God, they are scheming to do what? To put Lazarus to death as well. It wasn't now that they were just trying to kill Jesus. Now they were trying to kill the testimony of Jesus because it meant if Jesus is who he says he is, it means we lose our power. That we're no longer the ruling class. The religious leaders hostile to the work of God. Those that wore the robes, that said the prayers, that led the worship services. Their hearts are exposed at this mill. The contrast that John paints here, it's that same continuing contrast of light and darkness. Those worshipers like Lazarus and Simon and Martha and Mary beaming forth in the beauty of the light of the gospel and those sitting in that same room in ultimate darkness, Judas, a crowd, and religious leaders. What does this mean for us? It means that we need God to give us a clean heart. It means that we need, as we begin this Lenten season and this journey to the road to Calvary, 
that we now ask God to examine our own heart. Because the problem is our heart. Ezekiel said it like this. The Lord says to the prophet, they have a heart of stone. But there's going to come a day when I will give them a new heart. A heart of flesh. How does that happen, Tony? I believe it happens like this. When we pray a psalm or a prayer that's found in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me.